Welcome. My name is Franco Vaccarino, and I have the privilege of serving as President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Guelph. I'm delighted to welcome all of you uh, and to be here to share in this year's Guelph Lecture on Being Canadian. I'd like to acknowledge the contributions of former University of Guelph President Alistair Summerlee to past events and to emphasize the University of Guelph's ongoing commitment to this annual Guelph Lecture. I have to tell you, this lecture series is a wonderful model of how communities and universities can lift each other through community conversation on what it means to be Canadian. We live in a time of unprecedented change. In fact, I would argue that we're living in what might be one of the most dynamic periods in human history. And a big part of that dynamicity is seen in the fast evolving nature of how we connect with one another how we live together and coexist, how we adapt. The unprecedented pace of change has made the process of adaptation a new constant in our lives. Our ability to, uh, to embrace emerging social complexities and incorporate those complexities into our, our understanding of ourselves as Canadians is part of what I like to call healthy adaptation. When we look around us today, um, it's with great sadness as we look to the events, for example, in Paris, we're reminded of the tragic consequences of what can happen in our cities when there are those for whom emerging complexities are impossible to embrace. Our world is a very different place than it was even 20 years ago, and so is our country. We're challenged to adapt constantly, and I believe that the Canadian story is a story of success in this regard. Um, our history is a, is a story of immigration, and learning to live with and accommodate each other is a core element of life as Canadians. And I, and I was thinking a little bit about the, uh, the title of our lecture ser series, and it, and it occurred to me that maybe it's that very ability to adapt that helps to define who we are as Canadians. How do we live together? It's a very Canadian question. It's also an urban question. And, and we're here tonight to talk about our urban environments and how they connect with being Canadian. Now, we've already seen striking changes. Recently, as the Second World War, only half of Canadians lived in urban environments. Today, and some may be surprised, I was certainly surprised when I, when I saw this or heard this statistic, today some nine out of 10 Canadians live in urban areas. And so much of how we connect with each other as Canadians plays out in those urban environments. Guelph, Guelph was shaped by rural heritage. Our rural roots, here are still an important part of who we are, both for our campus and for our city. The Ontario Agricultural College began in the 1870s as a founding college of the University of Guelph. Today, our agricultural scholarship roots continue to be a centerpiece for our university as we enjoy worldwide recognition for our leadership in the agricultural sciences. We're known as Canada's Food University and we're known for our scholarship on sustainability issues and we see this all around us in so many ways like our teaming up with the city uh, of Guelph in the Grow Guelph Partnership, which helps attract businesses and investment in the agri-food sector. Now, the University of Guelph has, over the last 50 years, further emerged and further evolved as a comprehensive university where arts and culture also very much define our university and define our city, as well as the many related partnerships that we enjoy. Partnerships. Uh, such as the sustainability-related projects involving the City of Guelph, Transition Guelph, Ten Carden, and Emerge Guelph, and community building projects uh, such as the Guelph Jazz Festival. Today, that mix defines our city, our city uh, and makes it very much a magnet for migration of people and organizations. Now, having arrived uh, in Guelph with my family, and my wife, uh, Cosmina, is here with me uh, tonight, uh, we've arrived only this year, and I'm already so keenly aware, and we are, of those elements. Um, uh, we've, we've felt the city's vibrancy expressed through uh, its arts and culture, and its sense of community and caring, and its commitment to sustainability, and that conversation that exists between urban and rural. And I have to say that this mix, which I believe speaks to the power of, of this community, is a unique and, and distinctive feature of Guelph, and one that I have to say we should be uh, all enormously uh, proud of. Our urban areas are, are crucibles, they're vessels of, of innovation and creativity. And in many ways, and I've talked about the stress of adaptation, the related challenges in our, 
in our cities. But that same stress, I believe, um, those same stressors can also bring about another uh, impact, and that is innovation, create creativity, and fresh new thinking. The, the upside of change and uncertainty. Our cities are places where bodies and minds and ideas bump up against each other. And they're also the places where many potential solutions to 21st century problems will come from. And they'll come from, uh, they'll come from our cities through mixing and engaging with one another, through conversation. Conversations such as tonight's lecture. Tonight we get a chance to talk about what it means to be Canadian by looking at our cities and city life. And we have a wonderful evening ahead of us. The Aramosa Institute, together with many groups and individuals, have worked very hard to make tonight a, a reality. And they've done an absolutely terrific job. We've, we have brought to our community this evening an absolutely world-class slate of individuals to push forward our thinking as they share their viewpoints about being Canadian. And one of those individuals is Robert Enright. Robert Enright is a teacher, a writer, a broadcaster and a curator who divides his time between Winnipeg and Guelph. He's the senior contributing editor for Border Crossings magazine, magazine in Winnipeg. And every winter semester, he's a professor who holds the university research chair in art theory and criticism in the School of Fine Art and Music here at the University of Guelph. Professor Enright has contributed introductions, essays and interviews to over 80 books and publications in Canada and around the world and he's a frequent lecturer and moderator in Canada and the United States. In 2005, Professor Enright was made a member of the Order of Canada and he was awarded the Queen Elizabeth II uh, Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2012. We're delighted to have Professor Enright as our MC tonight. Please join me in welcoming Professor Enright who will say more about our evening program and our guests and be our host for tonight's wonderful event. Ladies and gentlemen, Professor Robert Enright. Thank you. I know you're applauding because you think I'm my cousin Michael Enright, <laughs> who he describes on his program, he says I'm his younger, smarter cousin. The truth of the matter is you can't trust an Italian from Toronto. I am younger, but nobody's smarter than Michael. I hope you heard that because I want to get on the program again. Um, this is the 12th uh, lecture in the On Being Canadian series, and I've had the pleasure of hosting it in 2005. And I'm pleased to say that in this regard, I'm not following in the esteemed footsteps of Oscar Wilde, who always said that he'd been invited to all the best parties once. Um, since this is one of the best lectures and I've been invited a second time, I can say in all honesty that I've escaped from one aspect of the wild. That said, I do live in two places, as President Vaccarino said, the wilds of Winnipeg and the more genteel, gentrified spaces of Guelph, Ontario. And so I'm privileged to be a person who can tell a tale of two cities, very special cities, I should say, too. One of the many things that makes Guelph special is this lecture series, which is an, an annual event that does so much to generate the necessary conversation about how we live in a time of great difficulty and a time of great possibility as well. Now, it's clear that a, an event like this can't be done without the generous support of a, of a whole number of sponsors. And, and the Aramosa Institute uh, manages to keep the ticket prices low because of the support of these people. I want you to hold your applause for them, but I do want to hear it uh, until the end um, because without them, uh, you wouldn't be here and I wouldn't be here as well. So um, the supporters of this event are the Musgettis, the Musgettis Fund for the KY Community Foundation, Walrus Magazine, uh, C&I Technologies and TELUS, Lion Financial Services, Making Money for You Financial Services, which I think is a distinctly impressive idea, <laughs> Kanar Jewelry, Cauley Insurance, They've been here for 80 years, a, f a local family who I had dinner with tonight. The Woolwich Arrow Pub, where I've consumed huge amounts of beer. <laughs> Borealis Grill, where I have had no food at all because it's on the way to Toronto. The University of Guelph, and it's lovely to have my boss introduce me. I'll keep that in mind when discussions come up about tenure. <laughs> Manhattan's Pizza Bistro. And, uh, where I ate all kinds of meals when I first came here because I was alone and no one would invite me for dinner. 
it's the truth. The, book, <laughs> the, book, the bookshelf where I continue to buy books at an alarming rate, Butterfly Salon and Spa, the Eden Mills Writers Festival, CFRU 93.3 FM, the University of Guelph Hospitality Services, and Lynn Design. So please join me in thanking these sponsors for the event. This year's Guelph Lecture uh, is part of a series for cities and pe called Cities for People, which is a national movement that connects people, ideas, and events in order to make our cities more livable, more inclusive, and more resilient. One of the supporters of the lecture, Musagetis, is the curator for the art and society theme of Cities for People. And to see how you can get involved in this, you can go to citiesforpeople.ca, and I recommend you do that as well. Now, before I introduce the first half of this evening's program, let me caution you uh, that not to take any flash photographs, and please uh, turn off your cell phones, otherwise you'll be uh, spanked. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the devil, man. It's the trouble when you raise Roman Catholic. He's always on one of your shoulders, that sucker. I'm delighted tonight to be able to introduce uh, two very gifted artists, um, the singer-songwriter Basha Balat and the novelist and memoirist Miriam Taves. I'm going to do, introduce them in reverse order um, because of, you'll see the way the evening's set up. Um, and after Basha's performance, there'll be a 15-minute admission, and then we'll meet again to, to uh, deal with in a, what I hope is a provocative and rich conversation about public space, uh, how we use it and how we abuse it. Basha Balat's third album, The Tall, Tall Shadow, was shortlisted for the 2014 Polaris Prize and nominated for a 2014 Juno Award in the Adult Alternative Album of the Year category. The album includes 10 songs that tell the story of a very hard year in an artist's life and the love that helped her get through it. Uh, Basha studied English at the University of Western Ontario. She's toured across Canada, the United States, Europe, and Australia. I think she's just, uh, she's working on a new album, and she's just come back from some exotic place in the United States. She's an honorary member of Ontario's Polonia Polish community. When Basha played the Bowery Ballroom in New York in 2013, the New Yorker magazine said that while she plays many instruments, she can make remarkable music without any of them. The notice referred to her confident and vulnerable tone, saying that she sings with an impassioned yearning that suggests the vast wilderness of her homeland. There's that wild thing again, eh? The New Yorker went on to add that, when she was that she was performing with backing musicians, not that she really needs them. We're lucky here in Guelph that the magazine's wish is our command. She'll be performing solo tonight. Uh, Miriam Tays was born in Manitoba in a Mennonite family, uh, and that setting has inspired a number of her remarkable books. She currently lives in Toronto, which is, of course, a mistake, but what can you do? Miriam has a BA in Film Studies from the University of Manitoba and a Bachelor of Journalism degree from University of King's College in Halifax. Her other books include Summer of My Amazing Luck, a book that grew out of a documentary she made for CBC Radio on the subject of welfare, on uh, the subject of welfare mothers, I'm sorry. Uh, it was shortlisted for the Stephen Leacock Memorial Award Medal for Humor and the McNally Robinson Book of the Year Award in Manitoba, a prize that she then won for her second novel, A Boy of Good Breeding. A Complicated Kindness was the winner of the 2004 Governor General's Literary Award for Fiction. The Flying Troutmans was winner of the Rogers Prize Trust in 2008, the Fiction Prize. Um, she's just, what's the collective noun for prizes? A pride of prizes? She has a pride of prizes. Her book, uh, Irma Voth, was inspired in part by her own experience as the lead actress on the film set of Silent Light, for which she was nominated for Best Actress in Mexico's uh, Ariel Awards in 2007. She's written one work of nonfiction, Swing Low, A Life, based on the death of her father by suicide. It won the Alexander Kennedy Isbister Award for Nonfiction and the McNally Robinson Book of the Year Award. Miriam's most recent book, from which she'll be reading tonight, is All My Puny Sorrows, published by Random House, which won the 2014 Rogers Trust Pri Fiction Prize and was a Giller Prize finalist. I read All My Puny Sorrows uh, over the last two days, and it's a profound book, um, full of heartbreaking love and heart mending, uh, full of heartbreaking loss and heart mending love. 
The story of two sisters, Elf and Yoli, is a new kind of love story. I urge you all to read it. It changes you. Please join me in welcoming Miriam Tays. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Robert. Take the boy out of Winnipeg, but uh, can't take Winnipeg out of the boy. <laughs> it's, it's wonderful to be here. That was a lovely introduction, and uh, uh, it's, it's particularly great to be here with this uh, amazing group of, um, this lineup of, of incredibly talented, smart women. Um, it's a real honor for me, and, and thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, I'm going to read from All My Puny Sorrows, which I like to call Amps. And uh, I'm going to read from the beginning. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, just a quick uh, intro. It's about, um, although I think <laughs> Robert already uh, described it, about two sisters, one uh, of whom uh, very much would like to die and the other who very much would like to keep her alive. Um, it's written from the younger sister's point of view. And, um, uh, and this first uh, bit is a uh, chapter, I think it's called, I guess, is, is about, uh, in the literary world, uh, it, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's about, um, it, so it's, it's a memory that, that, uh, that the younger sister has of uh, growing, growing up, and, uh, and uh, in the present day, the, these are women in their 40s, but this is a memory of them when they were kids, um, and it is, uh, there we go, and it, it's about Canadians, just in case you were wondering why I was here. All the characters are Canadian. <clears throat> Our house was taken away on the back of a truck one afternoon late in the summer of 1979. My parents and my older sister and I stood in the middle of the street and watched it disappear, a low-slung bungalow made of wood and brick and plaster, slowly making its way down First Street, past the A&W and the deluxe bowling lanes, and out onto the number 12 highway, where we eventually lost sight of it. I can still see it, said my sister Elfrida repeatedly, until finally she couldn't. I can still see it. I can still see it. I can still... Okay, nope, it's gone, she said. My father had built it himself back when he had a new bride, both of them barely 20 years old, and a dream. My mother told Elfrida and me that she and my father were so young and so exploding with energy that on hot evenings, just as soon as my father had finished teaching school for the day and my mother had finished the baking and everything else, they'd go running through the sprinkler in their new front yard, whooping and leaping, completely oblivious to the stares and consternation of their older neighbors, who thought it unbecoming of a newly married Mennonite couple to be cavorting, half-dressed, in full view of the entire town. Years later, Elfrida would describe the scene as my parents' La Dolce Vita moment and the sprinkler as their Trevi fountain. Where's it going? I asked my father. We stood in the center of the road. The house was gone. My father made a visor with his hand to block the sun's glare. I don't know, he said. He didn't want to know. Elfrida and my mother and I got into our car and waited for my father to join us. He stood looking at emptiness for what seemed like an eternity to me. Elfrida complained that the backs of her legs were burning up on the hot plastic seat. Finally, my mother reached over and honked the horn, only slightly, not enough to startle my father, but to make him turn and look at us. It was such a hot summer, and we had a few days to kill before we could move into our new house, which was similar to our old house, but not one that my father had built himself with loving attention to every detail, such as a long covered porch to sit in and watch electrical storms while remaining dry. And so my parents decided we should go camping in the badlands of South Dakota. We spent the whole time, it seemed, setting everything up and then tearing it all down. My sister, Elfrida, said it wasn't really life. It was like being in a mental hospital where everyone walked around with the sole purpose of surviving and conserving energy. It was like being in a refugee camp. It was a halfway house for recovering neurotics. It was this and that. She didn't like camping. And her mother said, well, honey, it's meant to alter our perception of things. Paris would do that too, said Elle, for LSD. <laughs> and her mother said, come on, the point is we're all together. Let's cook our wieners. The propane stove had an oil leak and exploded into four foot flames and charred the picnic table. While that was happening, Elfrida danced around the fire, singing Seasons in the Sun by Terry Jacks, a song about a black sheep saying goodbye to everyone because he's dying. And her father swore for the first recorded time, what in the Sam Hills, and stood close to the fire, poised to do something, but what, what? And her mother stood there shaking, laughing, unable to speak. 
I yelled at my family to move away from the fire, but nobody moved an inch as if they had been placed in their positions by a movie director and the fire was only fake and the scene would be ruined if they moved. Then I grabbed the half-empty rainbow ice cream pail that was sitting on the picnic table and ran across the field to a communal tap and filled the pail with water and ran back and threw the water onto the flames, which leapt higher then, mingled with a sense of vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry, towards the branches of an overhanging poplar tree. A branch sparked into fire, but only briefly, because by then the skies had darkened and suddenly rain and hail began their own swift assault, and we were finally safe, at least from fire. That evening after the storm had passed and the faulty propane stove had been tossed into a giant cougar-proof garbage cage, my father and my sister decided to attend a lecture on what was once thought to be the extinct black-footed ferret. It was being held in the amphitheater of the campground, and they said they might stick around for the second lecture as well, which is being given by an expert in astrophysics about the nature of dark matter. What is that? I asked my sister. And she said she didn't know, but she thought it constituted a large part of the universe. You can't see it, she said, but you can feel its effect or something. Is it evil? I asked her. She laughed. And I remember perfectly, or should I say I have a perfect memory, of how she looked standing there in her hot pants and striped halter top with a shadowy, eroded badlands behind her, her head back, way back, her long, thin neck and its white leather choker with a blue bead in the center her burst of laughter like a volley of warning shots, a challenge to the world to come and get her if it dared. She and my father walked off towards the amphitheater, my mother calling out to them, make kissing sounds to ward off rattlesnakes. And while they were gone and learning about invisible forces and extinction, my mother and I stayed beside the tent and played What Time Is It, Mr. Wolf, against the last remaining blotches of the setting sun. On the way home from the campground, we were quiet, we had driven for two and a half days in a strange direction that took us away from East Village until finally my father had said, well, fair enough. I suppose we ought to return home now. As though he had been trying to work something out and then had simply given up. We sat in the car looking solemnly through open windows at the dark, jagged outcroppings of the great Canadian shield. Unforgiving, said my father, almost imperceptibly. And when my mother asked him what he had said, he pointed at the rock, and she nodded, ah, but without conviction, as though she had hoped he'd meant something else, something they could defy, the two of them. What are you thinking about? I whispered to Elf. The wind whipped our hair into a frenzy, hers black, mine yellow. We were in the back seat, stretched out lengthwise, our legs entangled, our backs against the doors. Elf was reading Difficult Loves by Otalo Calvino. <clears throat> If you weren't reading right now, what would you be thinking about? I asked again. A revolution, she said. I asked her what she meant, and she said I'd see someday. She couldn't tell me now. A secret revolution? I asked her. Then she said in a loud voice so we could all hear her, let's not go back. Nobody responded. The wind blew. Nothing changed. My father wanted to stop to see ancient Aboriginal ochre paintings on the rock escarpments that hugged Lake Superior. They had endured mysteriously against the harsh elements of sun and water and time. My father stopped the car and we walked down a narrow, rocky path towards the lake. There was a sign that said danger, and in small letters explained that people had been known to be swept off these rocks by giant rogue waves and that we were responsible for our own safety. We passed several of these signs on our way to the water, and with each dire warning, the already deep furrow in my father's brow became deeper and deeper until my mother told him, Jake, relax, you'll give yourself a stroke. When we got to the rocky shore, we realized that in order to see the pictographs, one had to inch along slippery, wet granite that plunged several meters into the foamy water, and then hang on to a thick rope that was secured with spikes driven into the rock, and then lean way back over the lake, almost to the point of being horizontal, with your hair grazing the water. Well, said my father, we're not about to do that, are we? He read the plaque next to the trail, hoping that its contents would suffice. Ah, he said. The rock researcher who discovered these paintings called them forgotten dreams. My father looked at my mother then. Did you hear that, Lottie? He asked. Forgotten dreams. He took a small notebook from his pocket and wrote down this detail. But Elf was completely enchanted with the idea of suspending her body on a rope over crashing water, and before anybody could stop her, she was gone. My parents called to her to come back, to be careful, to use some common sense, to behave herself, to get back now. And I stood silent and wide-eyed, watching in horror what I believed would be the watery end of my intrepid sister. 
She clung to the rope and gazed at the paintings. We couldn't see them from where we stood. And then she described to us what she was seeing, which was mostly images of strange, spiny creatures and other cryptic symbols of a proud, prolific nation. When we did, finally, all four of us arrived back alive in our small town that lay just on the far western side of the rocky shield in the middle of blue and yellow fields, we weren't relieved. We were in our new house now. My father could sit in his lawn chair in the front yard and see, through the trees across the highway to First Street, the empty spot where our old house had been. He hadn't wanted his house to be taken away. It wasn't his idea. But the owner of the car dealership next door wanted the property to expand his parking lot and made all sorts of voluble threats and exerted relentless pressure until finally my father couldn't take it anymore and he buckled one day and sold it to the car dealer for a song, as my mother put it. It's just business, Jake, said the car dealer to my father the next Sunday in church. It's nothing personal. East Village had originated as a godly refuge from the vices of the world, but somehow these two, religion and commerce, had become inextricably linked. And the wealthier the inhabitants of East Village became, the more pious they also became, as though religious devotion was believed to be rewarded with the growth of business and the accumulation of money. And the accumulation of money was believed to be blessed by God, so that when my father objected to selling his home to the car dealer, there was in the air a whiff of accusation, that perhaps by holding out, my father wasn't being a good Christian. This was the implication. And above all, my father wanted to be a good Christian. My mother encouraged him to fight, to tell the car dealer to take a hike. And Alfreda, older than me and more aware of what was going on, tried to get a petition going amongst the villagers to keep businesses from expanding into people's homes. But there was nothing that could be done to assuage my father's persistent guilt and the feeling that he'd be sinning if he were to fight for what was his in the first place. And besides, my father was thought to be an anomaly in East Village, an oddball, a quiet, depressive, studious guy who went for 10 mile walks in the countryside and believed that reading and writing and reason were the tickets to paradise. My mother would fight for him, although only up to a point because she was, after all, a loyal Mennonite wife and didn't want to upset the apple cart of domestic hierarchy. But she was a woman anyway, so very easily overlooked. Now, in our new house, my mother was restless and dreamy. My father slammed things around in the garage. I spent my days building volcanoes in the backyard or roaming the outskirts of our town, stalking the perimeter like a caged chimp. And Elf began work on increasing her visibility. She had been inspired by the ochre paintings on the rock, by their impermeability and their mixed message of hope, reverence, defiance, and eternal aloneness. She decided she too would make her mark. She came up with a design that incorporated her initials, EVR, Alfreda von Riesen, and below those, the initials AMP. Then, like a coiled snake, the letter S, which covered, underlined, and dissected the other letters. She showed me what it looked like on a yellow legal notepad. Hmm, I said, I don't get it. Well, she told me, the initials of my name are obviously the initials of my name, and the AMP stands for all my puny. Then the big S stands for sorrows, which encloses all the other letters. She made a fist with her right hand and punched the open palm of her left hand. She had a habit then of punctuating all her stellar ideas with a punch from herself to herself. Hmm, well that's, how'd you come up with it? I asked her. She told me that she'd gotten it from a poem by Samuel Coleridge, who would definitely have been her boyfriend if she'd been born when she had a, should have been born. Or if he had, I said. She told me she was going to paint her symbol on various natural landmarks around our town. What natural landmarks? I asked her. Like the water tower, she said, and fences. May I make a suggestion, I asked. She looked at me askance. We both knew there was nothing I could offer her in the way of making one's mark in the world. That would be like some acolyte of Jesus saying, hey, you managed to feed only 5,000 people with one fish and two loaves of bread? Well, check this out. But she was feeling magnanimous just then, the excitement of her achievement, and she nodded enthusiastically. Don't use your own initials, I said, because everyone in town will know whose they are, and then the fires of hell will raineth down on us, etc. Our little Mennonite town was against overt symbols of hope and individual signature pieces. Our church pastor once accused Elf of luxuriating in the afflictions of her own wanton emotions, to which she responded, bowing low with an extravagant sweep of her arm, Mia culpa, my lord. Back then, Elf was always starting campaigns. She conducted a door-to-door -door survey to see how many people in town would be interested in changing the name of it from East Village to Shangri-La, and managed to get over a hundred signatures by telling people the name was from the Bible and meant a place of no pride. <laughs> hmm. 
Maybe, she said. I might just write amps with a very large S. It'll be more mysterious, she said. More je ne sais quoi. Precisely, I said. But don't you love it? I do, I said. And your boyfriend Samuel Coleridge would be happy about it, too. She made a sudden karate chop slice through the air and then stared into the distance as though she'd just heard the far-off rattle of enemy fire. Yeah, she said, like objective sadness, which is something else. Something else than what? I asked her. Yoli, she said, than subjective sadness, obviously. Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, I said. There are still red spray-painted amps in East Village today, although they are fading. They are fading faster than the hardy aboriginal ochre pictographs that inspired them. Thank you very much. Um, before I introduce our two distinguished uh, talking lecturers tonight, please join me in thanking uh, Miriam and Basha once more for their words and music. <laughs> Janice Gross Stein is one of the world's leading experts on peace, crisis, and security. She's the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto and the Bellsberg Professor of Conflict Management in the Department of Political Science. In 2001, she was the Massey Lecturer and published The Cult of Efficiency. A prolific writer and public intellectual, her other publications include Networks of Knowledge, Innovation in International Learning in 2000, Street Protests and Fantasy Parks in 2001, and most recently with Dilip Soman and Joseph Wong, Innovating for the Global South Towards an Inclusive Innovation Agenda in 2014. She is a contributor to Canada by Picasso in 2006, and co-author of The Unexpected War, Canada in Kandahar from 2007. As a testament to her significant contribution to global affairs, she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, an honorary foreign member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, a member of the Order of Canada and the Order of Ontario, and a Trudeau Fellow in 2001. She was awarded the Molson Prize by the Canada Council for her outstanding contribution as a social scientist to public debate. She's been awarded honorary doctors of law by the universities of Alberta, the University of Cape Breton, McMaster University, and Hebrew University. Bridget Shim, along with her partner, A. Howard Sutcliffe, formed the architectural design practice Shim Sutcliffe Architects in 1994, reflecting their shared interest and passion for the integration and interrelated scales of architecture, landscape, and interior and industrial design. They've received 13 Governor General's medals and awards for architecture and an American Institute of Architects National Honor Award, along with many other professional accolades for their built work ranging from projects for non-profit groups, as well as commissions for public and private clients. Bridget Shim is also a professor at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto. She was a board member of Build Toronto, an organization created by the Real Estate and Development Corporation to generate value from the city's real estate assets, and of Moreland's Community Services, a Toronto non-profit charity began in 1917, which helps inner city children and youth affected by poverty. She's a senior fellow at Massey College at the University of Toronto and is their college architect. And in 2013, she was made a member of the Order of Canada. Please join me in wel welcoming these two distinguished academics. That's pretty heavy-duty stuff. You didn't say we were friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm hoping to do my best to see your enemies before the evening's over. So. <laughs> That's my impish behavior. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here, a real honor to be here with both of you. And I think, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to try and uh, get a handle on this notion of public space, which is an immense and, and extraordinarily important notion uh, for, for ur urbanity. And I guess I'm going to start with Bridget and ask you if, if you have a sense I want to get a sense of your perspective on how our understanding of public space may have changed, say, over the last 30 or 40 years. Um, such an important topic for all of us and so um, relevant to life in the 21st century. Um, what I want to do is to share um, three examples. Uh, one really international, the other um, national, 
and the last local. And I'll just use a few slides, because I'm a visual person, <laughs> to really describe what I think are, is interesting about these spaces. So I'll be quick, but it'll really set a kind of frame to think about both the physical and the virtual idea of what public space is. And I think that, uh, in a way, it opens up a broader conversation where the physical is just the beginning of a much uh, bigger idea uh, that, that that is really uh, important for our future. So uh, maybe the first slide. Uh, this is a kind of image of uh, Beirut. And in a way, in uh, 2007, I was very fortunate to be on the jury of the Aga Khan Architecture Award, largest architecture prize in the world, set up in 1977 by the Aga Khan. And really, the mission is really projects that inspire and impact Islam society, Islamic society. But really, it's a kind of global prize. And in a way, if we go to the next slide, this is a very small space. It is actually about. 8,000 square feet, so maybe the Tiny. size of a big house, but a postage stamp size for a public space. It consists of a fountain, um, two trees, a long bench, and it's in a neighborhood in Beirut, which is under transition. Next slide, please. And in a way, what happened was the, the, the landscape architect, Vladimir Durovic, was asked to design a public space. And they said, and just get rid of the trees and really make a really great public space. Uh, so he, uh, his... Was that a condition to get rid of the trees? Yes. That was, yeah, yes. Okay, it was yeah. actually, they, they thought the trees were irrelevant <laughs> to the public space. And so what he did was he said, the landscape is our heritage, not just built form, but landscape. These were very old Ficus Benjamina trees. And he found a way, you can see in this picture, the people are standing on a wooden deck. So just above the base of the tree is a wooden deck that allows the tree's root system con to continue, water to fall in between, and he was able to save the trees, ensure that they had a long and healthy life, and, and that then he placed a large reflecting pool between a very busy traffic street and the trees themselves. And then you can see the one long bench on the other side, and it becomes a kind of really a neighborhood place. Next slide, please. And what's happened is it's become this beloved place in uh, Beirut. And the idea that you can actually make something that isn't very large, but can have a huge impact, I think, is really the important thing. And in a way, it was built properly. It was built with enduring materials. And it continues to be loved by both the neighborhood and has gained larger international acclaim. Mm -hmm. Maybe next slide. Some of you might know it. The image on the right is 1965 when the Toronto City Hall opened. Fanfare, lots of uh, you know, uh, lights and hoopla. Um, the result of an international competition started in 1958. And what's really important is that maybe Toronto wasn't ready for the building. Huge controversy, enormous. Nathan Phillips, the first Jewish mayor of Toronto, lost his seat and was not around for the actual opening of the actual plaza that was named after him. So kind of, uh, you know, incredible that, that the city was able to get it together to build this truly modernistic public space. So everything from farmer's markets, skating, uh, you know, reflecting pool in the summer, all kinds of art fairs, but also protests. When Jack Layton passed away, there were sort of chalk on the walls, really important as a place for gathering in a city that maybe didn't quite know how to deal with public space at the time. And then the next slide, which I think is actually really important, is that it was designed by Vio Ravel, a Finnish architect. So Finland comes to Toronto. Um, I think last year was the 100th anniversary if he had been alive. He didn't actually live to see the space completed. So here's this icon that I would say every single tourist bus that comes to Toronto goes to, even though it was so controversial at the beginning. And then the view on the right-hand side is actually the view from the mayor's office, which is not at the top of the city hall, as you would imagine. It's actually on the second floor. So he has to look eyeball to eyeball with everyone walking in and out of the city hall. And he's actually looking onto Nathan Phillips Square, the public space, because he's accountable to the people 
that, that he serves or she serves. And so it's a kind of really important message about that level of accountability. And does Rob Ford approve of that particular? For sure. And I, I think when he was there, there was actually a cutout, <laughs> and he was never really there. <laughs> I was just saying, you know, when Bridget, we were talking about the slide and we were talking about how important it was because public space is about accountability and putting the mayor's office really at mm -hmm. eye level rather than top down. It's a hard argument to make about Toronto, <laughs> I, I, yes, I have yes. to say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. there, I want to show you just two slides. Oh, just one, I have one oh, more. Sorry, so the, next, sorry. The, the last one the is the local. Yeah. So the next slide is actually uh, Market Square in Guelph, a wonderful right. example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I was recently at an awards ceremony for the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, and this project was premiated and really celebrated, so really, really special. And in a way, you have both the farmer's market, uh, next slide, please, and also skating. So there's this kind of sense of the seasons and really responding to our climatic zone, and then a place to gather in the winter as well as the summer, and then the last, next image is really also a place for really great events of an international caliber. So I think this was a jazz festival that happened recently. So the idea that it's really a place for all of the community to come together uh, to celebrate and to do day-to-day -day things as well as really special things, I think is really important about the nature of public space. So then the next slide. <laughs> so before I get to the next slide, I mean, just let me add briefly to what Bridget said. Um, we, we were having dinner tonight with members of the Guelph community and somebody who had come from Toronto and now lives in this community in the last year and was telling us what a wonderful community uh, Guelph is, how open, how welcoming. Uh, and then we moved to talk about the spaces in Guelph where he could join the community. Uh, so the physical space uh, matters, provides this opportunity for the community to come together. Mm -hmm. And so you can't, you, so connected to public space is community and community building. Mm -hmm. Now the last one, I was talking to Bridget as we were thinking about this, is my neighborhood park. So we went from the international to the national to the local um, to the neighborhood. So. Uh, my little row house looks over this park in downtown Toronto, but there's an interesting story to it. This was a park that was neglected um, and was not used by the community at all. Then, oh, so this is um, an apocryphal story in the sense that it has bad guys in it and good guys, <laughs> right? And you have to know who's who and it's very confusing when the bad guys aren't wholly bad and the good guys aren't completely good. So bear with me as we unravel this story. Now right? also you have to know these photos were taken on Janice's cell phone yeah, that's right. uh, on her way to work uh, yesterday. <laughs> yesterday because morning. Because we, we said it was really important that this was actually a very personal example, not a kind of, so these are not architectural photographs, but taken from her phone, and it was winter, and it's really cold, but it really gives, it's, it's her neighborhood, so just so you know. So this, in, around this neglected park, and it really was bad, it was littered with trash, uh, somebody put up a very, very high condominium tower, and the local, Ratepayers Association, which is the community that stands guard, was enraged and fought. And the ultimate decision was that the developer would gift the park. Right? There would be a million dollar gift to the park to renovate this park. And so the park was renovated. And really quite astonishing things happened. First of all, a piece of public art was put in the park. And so maybe if we go to the next image. See the next slide, you can so see the jug. Um, and it, it's made by an Aboriginal artist who used exactly the length of the steel rods that uh, are equivalent to the Paddle Creek that flows under this part of the city. And, there's t and in the summer, drops, literally a quiet, 
you know, rainfall, gentle rainfall comes out of the rim of that jug. And when I first saw it, and I looked at it and looked at it, and I was disappointed because it was quiet and it didn't really muffle city noise. But then I watched the two-year-olds and the three-year-olds. And the water was gentle enough so that they could come and play in it. And because it's circular, they, in fact, began to play in circular ways with other children. And so the artist, in this very subtle, creative way, replicated Aboriginal circles. And the, this sheer piece of public art channeled play in a way that built community. Now, the city still doesn't have enough budget to care for the park. But because there was community engagement now, there's an informal brigade. <laughs> so except on winter days, each, there's family that's charged with going around with a long stick broom and a little dustpan uh, and collects the trash. And we do this five out of seven days. And the park is now jammed with young families, older people, mixed neighborhood, um, people from everywhere in the downtown core. That's public space. There's no government money involved. It's not about separating um, the private from the public. It's about new forms of partnering between the private sector and the community, but it's also about the capacity of a community to make public space. It's we who make important spaces to come together. When I start this question in talking about if our understanding of how public space functions and is used is different now than it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago, if you look at the Beirut example, that's a kind of interval inside the city in a way. The Nathan Phillips Square and even here in Guelph, those seem, are those also spatial intervals that, that interrupt the nature of, of urban living, or in fact, are they continuous with it? And there are ways in which we plug ourselves into what the city already is. I mean, I mean and is that different than it would have been in 19th century Paris or 1940s New York, uh, the way that these spaces are being used? Richie, yeah. you want to go first? Well, I mean, I think that these spaces, um, I mean, the Nathan Phillips Square is, quote, a modern space. Mm -hmm. um, it's a kind of part of the modernist tradition of the, the podium, the plaza, uh, but I think that in a way, um, we need to learn to love public space. We need to learn to use it really well. And I think mm. that in a way, I feel like Nathan Phillips Square has taught Torontonians a lot. Mm. And that we've come to this thing that, that created huge kind of rifts and controversy is now beloved. Yes. And if you were to take it away, you would have a huge outcry because people actually feel connected to this space. It is iconic, isn't it? It is mm -hmm. the image of Toronto. Mm -hmm. Yes, but mm -hmm. I, I mean, Bridget's point is very important. It was controversy, mm -hmm. right? But having um, a controversy, a fierce argument with your neighbors in the city about a building, <laughs> and, and not only about a building, but about a square, because it's Nathan Phillips Square. square. Mm -hmm. There were the two iconic buildings, but what's really important is that big square mm -hmm. in front of the building that everybody uses in different ways. And to argue passionately about that. So yes, it interrupts daily living, to use your words, Robert, but it doesn't interrupt the city. Mm -hmm. It provides spaces for people to come together to argue. That's a or, or, or to, That's a or profoundly to, important thing to do. Or to be together, or to be together at difficult times. Right. So when yes, you're exactly. in that space, you know, at, after Jack Layton passed away, it was a very powerful experience. People were very quiet, and you just saw the entire sort of concrete that went up to the sec upper level was just full of chalk chalk on the ground, chalk. It was just people had to write something. They just needed to connect. And that space was actually the place to do that. It is interesting how those public squares now across the world have become the focal Absolutely. points for a kind of sense of social articulation mm -hmm. against the very governments you're talking to are well, not playing any role in. You know, even before that, Robert, look, Bridget and I were talking, look what's happened in Paris in the last two days. Mm -hmm. So what did people intuitively and instinctively do on Wednesday evening? 
um, without any concerted action mm -hmm. um, or direction from the top, people came into the Place de la, de la République with lit candles. Why did they do that? Because they wanted to come together at a time of sorrow. Right? and to grieve together and to share the experience and to strengthen community bonds. Well, you need public space to do that in. And we see this over and over. Tahrir Square in Cairo. It was a public space that people used to protest. And Tiananmen Square, of course. Tiananmen Square in Beijing. Every revolution has been made in public space. Mm -hmm. So it's an absolutely integral part of the DNA, really. Um, at every level of society. You, you emphasize, uh, Janice, uh, the notion of community, and there's a wonderful line from William Carlos Williams, the American poet, who talks about, in writing about Patterson, a local pride. Right. Uh, w how much of this is generated out of what you're calling community, which is a kind of very specific and passionate sense of locale and locality for the people who live in those areas? Is that what is going to generate a more usable and better public space than what we've had before? I understand the question, and I think the answer is at times, but not always. Um, so I'm not so I'm not convinced always that it's a particular locality, as it is um, the need to connect. Mm -hmm. And in order to connect with people, you need the space to do it, and you need a space to do it in that is welcoming and hospitable. But if we Look, we, we go back to your early question about how it's changing in the 21st century. Um, some of you may know that I am now involved in creating what I call a digital public square. That's a virtual public square um, in which people who actually don't have access for a whole variety of reasons to public spaces in their own community are not able to come together, are not able to talk openly, um, so we design, and in, uh, just as an architect does, we architect new public spaces that live on, you know, in virtual platforms where people do exactly what we've been talking about. They come together to protest. They come together to grieve, to commemorate, to connect. So when we think about that, the difference between the materiality of a very local physical space uh, versus a digital public space. Particular locale is important, but not in that material way that you're talking about. But it is interesting, Bridget, the, the, the notion of, of public space has traditionally argued the human presence in that space. And as someone who, who builds things that exist in space, is, is there a generational difference in the way that perhaps we understand public space now is the generation that is much younger than me, would they have a different relationship and understanding of, of how public space can be used than say my generation would have or even yours because you're considerably younger than I am? So I, I think that we're not we, going there. No, no, I'm sorry. No, no. This is just between us. Yes, it's got yes, nothing yes. to do with you. So, so I think that the young, I mean I teach at the, in, a, in an architecture school, space matters to my students but also the virtual is their world as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I would say it's not an either or condition, they actually want both. And they don't really think that it's necessary to choose between them, both are actually part of their universe. And I think the oscillation between them and the kind of ability to be so fluid and dynamic between the two is a 21st century condition. And it is really reflective of the kind of, the, the validity and the necessity of both. As we see, we, we know the statistics about the number of people now living in cities is not only huge now. In 15 years, it'll be oh, even wow. more so, over. So in fact, and the cost of running cities if they have a sense of sprawl is obviously inordinately expensive. Do we have to reconceive our notion of what cities are as well, that we, we build up rather than out, and that in building up we have to find new ways to create public spaces that are, that are, that are material and outside of the virtual? Yeah, I mean, this is clearly Brizit's domain that we're on, but if, if we're thinking about sustainable cities going into the 21st mm -hmm. century and beyond, clearly we have to use public resources very differently. We have to be able to build density. Um, in, you know, in along thoroughfares, but in sensible ways. But as we think about building and building up, not 
uh, out. We also have to think about where are we creating those opportunities for mm -hmm. communities to come together. Uh, you know, spaces cannot simply be in the shadows of tall buildings. <laughs> Uh, so mm -hmm. I think we're going to think much more imaginatively uh, about how we build those spaces. Where are they? Are they inside? Yes, some of them are, mm -hmm. and they're accessible. Are they outside? How do we, in fact, make the trees uh, not an impediment to public space, but very much part of public space? So would who gets to decide how That's those the key space question. Would you? That's the key I question. I mean, you know, because you had a lovely, I want to say, almost utopian notion that, that, that government isn't involved in this. Let's no, no, no. I'm saying we have to move beyond, beyond government. Okay. That the, the 20th century notion was that governments created and funded public space. Right. I think the fundamental difference in the 21st century is we move beyond that. We understand we make public space. So, who, and, and are we then prepared to pay for that public space that's being generated out of that sense of community? I think there become different ways that those public spaces are funded. The cities actually are generators of economies. They mm -hmm. drive our kind of whole kind of, you know, uh, our whole um, economic force. And so within there, there have to be ways to actually um, create durable, long-lasting, well-designed public space that people can actually call their own. And I think that it's really a challenge, but I think design is actually part of all of our worlds and it matters and the more participatory roles uh, for people that are stakeholders citizens the the better off those spaces will be so it's not like you're someone someone creates a public space for you you're part of realizing that and maybe i can use a couple of examples to to uh, demonstrate that next slide please uh, this is the Canadian Centre for Architecture, very sort of um, highbrow, uh, wonderful <laughs> institution in Montreal. Uh, in 2007, they had an exhibition called Tools for Action. And it was actually not what you would think that would be in a, a kind of architecture museum. And in a way, what they were saying was that in a way, um, it was about gathering actions that reinvent our daily lives and reoccupy urban space with new uses. They looked at walking, playing, recycling, gardening, and actually found examples within the global condition where people were actually taking ownership of those things and actually um, making a difference. So maybe the next slide is actually an example in the United Arab Emirates. This is number 79 of the 99 actions. And this is actually a space in the Emirates. And what they did is they took a public space that existed and they actually used a painted lines for a soccer field. So they actually never touched anything in the public space except for two cans of paint, a paintbrush, and two goals at either end. But by doing that, it really brought a whole different constituent group to the public space that had never been there before, never felt connected to the space, and that in a way, um, some of the existing elements, the benches and other parts of the public space were now used for spectators, for football, and other activities could still happen, but it actually opened up the use of this public space. You know where you see that too, Bridget? You see that in community gardens. Yes. Right? Those are, in many ways, self-organized. Mm -hmm. So people come together, divide, you know, <laughs> divide the, the available land into pots. It's often unused, vacant land, so it's not done with permits always. It's not done with permission. People come together, divide it up. There's usually not a lot of argument about it. Often talk together about what they're going to plant, what crops, what food mm -hmm. they're going to grow. Have to come together and collaborate on irrigation. So have to develop a shared scheme for watering, agree on harvesting. That's an example of a public space at the very heart of a, a very dense city. Yeah. And that'd be he that's a hell of a disadvantage for the goalkeeper having those yeah. lights. <laughs> I gotta say, you know, yes. I, I don't know about that. But they're working it out. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. Uh, like this. So Have you seen these in the favelas also? Oh, yes. In Sao Paulo? So you see what, what Bridget's just describing, you see this in favelas yeah. in Sao Paulo, right? Where even smaller space than this becomes a shared place for kids to play soccer. And it's interesting, there's a migration too. What we consider traditionally in so-called third world countries, 
the, the people who are living in poverty, that's becoming the middle class. I mean, this yeah. is shifting, isn't it? The demographics yes. of who yes. is inside and outside so-called wealth patterns is changing pretty fundamentally right. in our cities. But in some ways, in dangerous ways, right? Yeah. Because if you look at what, what we're seeing in some cities, and you see it in Paris, um, not to take examples closer to home, but you see wealth concentrated in the inner ring in Paris, migrants essentially in the banlieue mm -hmm. that ring the city, high unemployment, low levels of education, higher levels of poverty, very high levels of frustration. And even more reason for places for us to come together, right. even mm -hmm. more important and essential. Um, what was really interesting about this CCA exhibition was that um, I took my students there from the University of Toronto they were so inspired by the actions that took place that they actually proposed new actions. And by the time the term had ended, three of my students had actions in the Canadian Centre for Architecture exhibition. So the idea that it's not about the kind of, we know everything, but it's actually again about a different kind of conversation that's actually taking place all around the world. And I think that's so important to actually empower people to actually say, this is not just my neighborhood park, it's our neighborhood park. And that we can actually make the difference. I think Janice's example, literally, you know, a stone's throw from her house is actually really, um, really emblematic of a different way of seeing public space and understanding its meaning to a large, much larger group. It begs the question of inclusivity, though, that the people who live in your neighborhood have, have presumably common aims and are prepared in some senses to absorb whatever the cost might be no, to keep that park going, no? No, no, I, I think, no, I actually think that's not right. And I think there's a, there's a you know what Bridget and I are saying is a, we're telling you a very optimistic story. Yeah. You're kind of resisting the optimism. Well, I mean, because you neither... That's very you, Canadian. Yeah, I know. Not, yeah. <laughs> so you, let me you, tell you the Usually we're optimistic. so bored sitting on the fence, you know. That's this, right. So I'm, I'm, and I'm, we're not sitting on the fence on this one. So let me tell you the optimistic story, because what Bridget and I are both saying in different ways is you can make public space. So there are... What's the cost of the neighbors maintaining this right. park at? Yes, you have to get up one morning a week, 20 minutes earlier, and take your dustpan and your broom that you probably have anyway, and a sustainable garbage bag, and go and clean the park. That's not an issue of inclusivity or exclusivity. Now, the, more, the deeper question there, though, is where's the initial mm -hmm. financing that creates that park? But if we ask the question that way, that's a solvable problem. But in order for, for if, even if we get the funding, what's crucial, what, what does sustainability mean here? It doesn't mean only environmental sustainability. It means that the community members who live around it feel enough of a sense of having a voice. They had a voice. You know, they decide where the slide goes and where the fountain goes and whether it's pebbles or whether it's grass. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who, it's their part. That's the point. And that's a great citizen story. And it shows us where governance is moving in the 21st century. It's moving away from government towards citizens. Well, you're, that's, yeah. that is a very optimistic that's a great story. story. Because I, it's a fabulous story. And I'd be prepared to buy all the chapters of it. But I'm not sure <laughs> that, it's, that it's necessarily happening. What, what I have a sense of is, in fact, the notion of the citizen is fundamentally disappearing in this country and in most countries that the idea that you had a moral obligation to be the citizen of a country, whatever that notion of country meant, seems to be less obvious today than it was 50 but years ago. But that's a very, I think the reason you're, you, and you write about that, if we look at the old indicators, uh -huh. voting, right? People yeah, vote much exactly. less and young people are especially, um, I'm looking, trying to find the strongest word that isn't a four-letter one, but... Um, <laughs> They're reluctant to, to, to yes. exercise their democratic yes, responsibility. Yes, they do not exercise their yes, democratic yeah, responsibility. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah, you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> for that. Uh, I like those big words. Uh, but, you know, these are, these are, in a sense, 20th century measures, yeah. right? And I'm saying we need to look beyond that now. We need to look at how citizens take leadership, right, in the activities that matter to them. And the activities that matter to them today are coming together in public spaces to protest, to mourn, to commemorate, to grieve, uh, to organize. Young people are great 
at, at organizing social movements. They, and for them, voting is not the issue. It's giving voice and song and, and giving back and giving mm -hmm. back. Mm -hmm. Uh, these are all new ways of coming together. And so we have to look at those spaces in the century in which we're living with the tools, including the virtual tools, that we have at our disposal. And there is a good story there. And social media becomes the way that people mm -hmm. actually get to the physical public space. Right. You know, so the kind right. of, so again, you know, throw out the, the textbook, because in a way, in many ways, we need to start over again. But physical is physical. You know, you're not going to, you know, the, the height of a bench or the kind of the, the, the length of a goalpost. These are kind of not going to change. But the ways that we actually interact is, is multifaceted. And I think that that's really uh, exciting as a kind of uh, way of, you know, there just become more pieces to the puzzle. The menu gets longer and it just gets more complex. But so if, if we accept the fact that there seem to be generational differences in our, in our acceptance and understanding and use of public spaces, are there also cultural ones? I mean, is, is, is Canada in that sense homogeneous or, or is, are there different parts of Canada and they also have different recognitions of how public space can be used? Is Quebec the same? as Ontario, is Ontario the same as British Columbia? And is that even a, a question that we can in any way wrap our minds around? You know, I think obviously, because I spent so much time outside of Canada as well as here, mm -hmm. uh, culture really matters. Uh, and people bring to bear in public space their cultural tradi traditions. Mm -hmm. So, you know, speaking of the Aga Khan Foundation, the Aga Khan Foundation rebuilt Babur's Palace um, in Kabul. Now, would you think that's the highest priority for a foundation in a war-torn society, to restore Babur's palace? It was transformative. Mm -hmm. Why? Because families came with their children and barbecued by the thousand, because this was the only clean, available space in a city that had been destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, we, we might not do it that way, but the underlying motive was very similar. You know, I actually knew the Egyptian regime, Mubarak's regime, was in trouble seven years before he fell. Now, how did I know that? Because I happened to be in Cairo at the time that the judges went on strike. And I was with students. And what were they doing? They were using social media. They were texting each other on their phones, saying, go to the square, go to the square. And I could literally watch this unfold in front of my eyes. So here again, Egyptians did it differently, but the, they, it was focused around a public space. Mm -hmm. And out of that comes transformative change, now for good or for ill, but it, it is everything that's important, that's dynamic, that's transformative, happens in public spaces. Is the process that gets us to public spaces being made as significant or more significant than the actual spaces themselves? I mean, I'm interested in knowing how important that community engagement is that in is ongoing and continuous. I mean, is that really the story about the utility of public space? Oh, I think essential, essential to this new definition of what it is. So maybe we could just go to the next slide. You're really good with this slide thing, you know. Yeah, you, we you, just you, keep you. moving through. <laughs> so She's Venice, visual. She's visual. She's visual. She's visual. I, need, I need the visuals. <laughs> Venice Biennale, so really important kind of uh, architecture fair. So one year it's art, the next year it's architecture. And in 2012, the, the US pavilion was called Spontaneous Interventions Design Action for the Common Good. Can you believe that? This is the US pavilion. <laughs> Uh, so in a way it says here, citizens around the world are, are devising and implementing clever, low barrier urban interventions to make their cities more inclusive, sustainable, safer, pleasurable, and the good news is that the city leaders and design professionals are looking at these actions for inspiration. So it's, a kind of, it's the other way around, as opposed to us, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're really listening to the people that are actually using the spaces. So maybe the next slide is a really great example. Uh, they actually had 100 interventions. So this one is actually called um, the Jackson Heights Green Alliance. So they worked with the Department of Transportation in Queens. It took several years and they closed one block of 78th Street off to cars in order to create play spaces. The city did not want them to do this, so they actually decided they would do it temporarily. They got them to agree only on every other weekend, and then for part of the summer, 
and this is actually AstroTurf on the asphalt itself. And then it took several years, but the city agreed to block the street off permanently for a neighborhood that had so little green open space. So in a way, you know, the, 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 all the reasons not parking, you know, we're going to lose business, all these things. But after they did it temporarily, they realized the world didn't fall apart. And then they got to do it the next weekend. And the, so, so it's a really a step-by-step -step condition. But in a way, this incremental approach has really created an urban space that did not exist but was really needed uh, for kids to play in. You know, you use the word intervention, and what interests me about that is intervention is a word that is traditionally associated in art practice with, with, with aesthetics. How important is the notion of art and beauty in the way that we begin to shift our understanding of how, of how and what public spaces are? You know, I, I, I should let Bridget answer that one. But, but you're going to say. But I'm going to say, but I'm not. Yeah. It's, a, it's a very nice strategy. That, uh, I know. I, I love it. Good, good, yeah. it, it well done. It's, it's good done. Well, no, it's yes, very, I'm impressed. Yes. I'm impressed. Um, but, um, you know, art and beauty is subjective. Um, and it's cultural. Mm -hmm. And it's community determined. So what one community may think is beautiful, another community, and another, you know, look at the arguments to, to give you concrete examples. That jug looked beautiful, by the way. It looked like a I very think it beautiful is. I object. I think it is, yeah. and you know, but it is, you know what? Not everybody in the community likes it. Mm -hmm. And so it was contested, right? <laughs> now, when I see this contestation, I'm cheering, and why is that? Because what are people will stand, talk, say, I hate it, I hate it. Why does somebody put an ugly thing in the neighborhood? It's probably scaring the kids. And somebody else comes along and says, no, but it's wonderful. It's wonderful. And people don't know each other in the neighborhood. All of a sudden, they're discussing, what do they like? Is it art? Is it not art? What's the story? Who's the artist? And a whole conversation develops. If I'm in the neighborhood, they scare the kids. So, you, know, you just don't want, yeah, you yeah. don't want me yeah. in the park. That's so, for sure. you know, in that sense, an argument about art is, okay. is a wonderful argument to have. If I look at what happened in Paris in the last 48 hours, I say to myself, an argument about art is mm -hmm. a miracle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, So, so how do we, I mean, I, I love the idea that in fact this can be, in a sense, community generated. But there is the larger question of some things have to in fact be, there needs to be a pretty significant contribution from various levels of government. How do we generate out of local, provincial and federal governments the kind of disposition that makes the way you're talking about what public space is even possible? Partnerships. Different kinds of partnerships. In a way, this event is a partnership of right. many different people. It would never have happened without the kind of coming together of both private, public, uh, and citizens to actually realize the resources to make the conversation possible. And in a way, I think that part of what we have to create is new conversations and new relationships. Uh, so in a way, in the case of Janice's neighborhood park, you're asking for more density, which I think mm -hmm. is you know, part of creating better cities, and, and part of that sort of generation of wealth by going higher, there's a kind of trade-off that goes with that, and it's not a negative mm -hmm. trade-off, but a positive one in actually enabling a kind of public space to be revitalized and for the entire community around it to actually be part of its metamorphosis. See, there's a very interesting shift, isn't it? It's interesting, density used to be. I mean, when I was a 25-year-old guy looking at cities, density was the thing you wanted to avoid. You wanted to get mm -hmm. your house, which was, yeah. maybe if it was on the outskirts of the city and the country, that was what you wanted. You didn't want to be part of this urban romanticism that, in fact, we have we now come to accept the fact that density yeah. and lots of people in a place is actually the generator and the catalyst for the so, kind of thing we're talking about? that was the age of the suburb, probably, the okay. age of the car, yeah. right? Uh, and we weren't worrying very much about the environment mm -hmm. at all yeah. at that point. Uh, and that's when cities really spread out. Um, but there was, a, there was a loss when that happened because um, everything we know about cities is that they are at their best, they are at their most creative when people are bumping up against right. each other, right. when there's friction, right? When there's too many people crowded on the train, you have to put your elbows in. Uh, and, and conversations start, and, the, and their diversity in the city. 
There are different kinds of people living in different kinds of housing in close proximity to one another. All the really important um, innovations have come out of that kind uh -huh. of bumping up. So the period you're talking about may have been one of these ignorant aberrations <laughs> that occur quite frequently in history. You may have a little bit of nostalgia for it, but I don't. <laughs> Anybody voting for ignorant aberration as a, out there? Or, you know, uh, let, let me just shift it to something that interests me a, a lot about a, a larger sort of global sense of, of, of what public space and right. cities become. You tell a wonderful story in an essay in the, the most recent book you've done about the, the Tata Nano, the car. This yes. is a car built in India, costs only $2,500. Right. It's, it's built cheaply, it's built ecologically sound. The trouble is a burgeoning, rising middle class in India doesn't want to buy a $2,500 yeah. Tata, they want to buy a BMW. So yeah. what do we do here in the West when we're pointing a slightly admonitory figure, finger at those countries that are now coming online with huge economies, China and India being one, and we're telling them you can't have what we had, you've got to have the Tata Nano, which is a $2,500 car. So, so that's a really fascinating story about the Tata Nano because, of course, it was made by an Indian company that should have listened much better to the people that were going to use the product, mm -hmm. right? And so they came to grief because they didn't. The larger question, though, is if you go to China now and cities like Beijing and Shanghai and another 50 cities, people are choking. They are mm -hmm. ill with respiratory illnesses. So the older way of building cities um, is not a Western concern. It's, a, it's, it's the highest priority now on the Chinese agenda because they are aware that they are, not going to be, they are not going to be able to provide what they call a minimum standard of good life. Um, to 70% of their population. From a health perspective. From a health perspective, if they don't change the trajectory. That's why you got the agreement you got between the United States and China. Not because the United States was able to impose its will on China, but because mm. China itself and its leaders, and by the way, this is an area, because it's not politically dangerous, where citizens in China have taken the lead. Um, they have led the environmental mm. protests they're the ones with the thermometers that are measuring pollution and publishing it on Weibo. Mm -hmm. So it's an example very much of how, because of how citizens have taken the lead in a regime which is difficult to influence like China, but they've taken the lead and they've said, we have to reshape our public space because air is our public space. Mm -hmm. So that recent book, uh, the manifesto called The Country of Cities, are we moving towards a, a, a country of cities? That's a manifesto mm -hmm. for America, yeah. but it seems mm -hmm. to me it's also mm -hmm. a manifesto for what's, what's inevitable in the world. So if we accept the country of cities, are we moving in the right direction about how we can inhabit that country? Well, I mean, I think that uh, we know it's possible to achieve it. It just requires the pushing and the pulling in many ways. You know, I think the kind of, once you're in Guelph, you don't have to think much about traffic, but to get here, there's a big issue <laughs> of traffic. We live in Toronto and traffic is a terrible thing. We, we talk about the weather, but we also talk about the traffic. And so in a way, the kind of need to address and fix these things that make our cities better, again, you know, it's gonna be pushing from below and, and pressure from above and, and both to kind of make sure it happens. So, so in a way, we could wait till the federal government funds transit, or there are people that have taken initiatives that may that create controversy to get from neighborhood A to neighborhood B, and by doing it, it sort of puts to shame the kind of bigger authorities and how slow and how cumbersome they are and how little action there's been for a lot of talk. So you know, it's it, it's it's very discouraging how paralyzed our politics are. Mm -hmm. Um, how difficult it is to get far-seeing investment in things that we all know we need. Um, and I think we have to be honest about that. Um, we, we're just discouraging. <laughs> um, and, you know, we're very smug when we talk about the United States and we look at the gridlock south of the border. But we have our share of gridlock on issues that we know mm -hmm. are important to us. 
So that's where I agree with Bridget. That is going to come from pressure from below. Why do you think transit was the number one issue in the mayoralty election in the city of Toronto? Because the voices were so loud. One thing I do know from experience is politicians poll all the time. They do it obsessively. Mm -hmm. I mean, obsessively, they're fixated. Mm -hmm. You know, they get it on their smartphones in the morning. Um, and so what the public thinks really matters. matters to them all the time. So we underestimate our own capacity to make change. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, you're both optimistic because that capacity... Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that if pe citizens feel that their voice is heard, and they can make a difference, I think it matters. And sometimes you don't think you can make a difference at the kind of federal, provincial level, but you can actually make a difference in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And I think that if, everyone. We can, if everyone can actually think of, you know, a handful of actions that they could do, it makes a huge difference collectively. And I think that that's where we can't be complacent. We need to actually think, know that, that, our, that we can actually do things physically and virtually that actually matter. Do you have any more slides? Um, <laughs> the, only, no, the only reason I'm asking is because it wasn't, is because no, no. I want to open up to questions. Totally. Go ahead. I think okay. that's great. Yep. Um, we can probably get the house lights up if that, I don't know how you got, how our technical guys feel about that. That's well, a good idea because we can't more see light, the questions. More lights than Milton yeah. said. Um, what, what we're going to do is um, take about three questions at the same, like uh, consecutively, and then allow both Janice and Bridget to kind of uh, do their own uh, commingling of them in responding. So, if if any, and we'll take more than three, but let's just start off with three, and then see w uh, what uh, road that takes us down. Don't be shy. <laughs> Remember the spanking. It never goes <laughs> Good. Yeah, in the balcony, in the balcony about Yeah, yeah it's, oh, so of course, no, of course, ask it, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Oh, very good. I was going to ask, um, what is the role of commercial entities in public space and on average, is that a good thing or is that not a good thing? So we're going to listen to three yeah. first. Good question, so yeah. Okay. You're, you're, you're take another one? Thank yeah. you, sir. Okay, and maybe uh, use the microphone if, if that makes it easier. I'm way up here. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, you Olympians up there, you're always yelling for attention. Do you think there should be a certain percentage of public space per capita? For, for, for which? Capita. Per capita. Per capita. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, there's your density. And a third question, uh, sir. <laughs> nice trick. <laughs> Okay, we can, we can yeah. do it in reverse okay. order. Yeah. You, you might so, explain yeah. what the High yeah. Line is. Yeah. So the High people... Line was an old uh, railway line that runs through a part of Manhattan. It was derelict for many years. A lot of my friends were actually part of the group that actually fought to save the High Line. There are great things about the High Line. The landscape is wonderful, great benches, wonderful uh, activity. It's hard to call it a truly public space. They open the doors at a certain time, they close the doors at a certain mm. time. After, you know, uh, in the middle of the night, you don't get to walk on the High Line. So mm. it's a kind of part of, in New York, there are a whole series of these look like public space, <laughs> but don't really act like public space, mm. public spaces. Um, it's a kind of part of, again, the sort of privatization. Um, and, and there are a lot of uh, cut-throughs between one block and the other that are like that. During the day, you walk through them, but at night, they get locked. So it's a, it's a bit complicated, I think, and I would say the kind of, the nature of publicness is a kind of a question. So I, so I think there's so many great qualities about the High Line, but it's hard to consider it a truly 
public space. So would a better High Line be one that had the, could, would be open 24 hour, 24 mm -hmm. seven? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and and then mm -hmm. what they may be worried about there is whatever happens at three o'clock in the morning if someone's walking up there and who polices that? Is that? I mean, I know one yeah. of the concerns about the High yeah. Line is cost. Yeah, yeah. And, and and lighting. Yeah. Right and yes. lighting, so um, that's, and security that's... and all those things. But there's a definition. In a way, it's it's hard to call it truly public. Mm. It is it is a kind of used space, and it's used by the public. But public space, I would say, uh, from my understanding, has a different, slightly different definition. So the next question was: You would be very good on the commercial. What role does the, can the commercial, the commercial play in the in the generation of public space? So I think it depends, right? There's not uh, a one size fits all answer here. Uh, I, I think clearly we need to look. Um, to the private sector to partner. Uh, and, you know, this example of the density uh, where this building went up 26 stories, I, I can't remember what it is, you know. Uh, Taller, you know, and it caused havoc among the neighbors because of shade, shade. I mean, there's a NIMBY quality too, right? <laughs> to a lot of us uh, around these issues, which is not very public spirited, let me put it to you that way. Uh, but the fact that there was then investment in the community is a good thing, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned. The yeah. density is a good thing, but the demand that when you're building at this level of density, you want to reinvest in the community is, a, I think, is an absolutely reasonable expectation. I think it should become the norm, frankly. You know, should we have um, a, a per capita rule? a public space, you know, nothing rigid ever works. <laughs> nothing rigid ever works because as soon as you make a rule, what really matters are the exceptions to the rule, not the rule. Um, but I think we need norms. Uh, and I think what we really need to do is understand how important these public spaces are um, to the community, to, to healthy urban living. Um, to the creation of active citizens. And we need to have just rules of thumb which say, mm -hmm. we are going, um, as citizens, as communities, the private sector, we are going to invest more and more in the creation of open, accessible, high safe, quality, high quality, sustainable public space. It's, it's, it's fundamental to the health of cities, but beyond that, we can't have good politics if we don't have good public spaces. Mm. Well, it's the other way around. The good public spaces create the good politics. There are governments, I would argue, and perhaps even current ones in Canada, who would in fact don't want that debate, and so they would be resistant to the notion of the public space as a form in which the very kind of democratic conversation you're talking about can and, and would inevitably occur. Be that as it may, uh, <laughs> it's citizens who drive that. Right. But in a way, Jan a lot of the work Janice is um, pioneering is this idea of virtual public space, That's right. mm -hmm. which I think you know is of importance to everyone in the world. This kind of ability to have a voice and to shape, in effect, the kind of openness of that conversation is a design issue, a design right. problem yes. that is really essential to a future conversation. There's something very, very profound to me as a human being, though, that that the virtual space, social media, that drives that conversation drove those people into public spaces so that they could actually embody their protests. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, because sometimes the dangers of going there sure. are still too great. Mm -hmm. But you know, we had um, a, a long and intense discussion, so it's not by accident that we called what we're doing digital public square, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, so the third, the gentleman's question about should there be some relationship between public it. space and and, and uh, per, uh, a kind of per capita public space based on some kind of population densities? Do we need? Uh, what, I mean, what do you, you say there shouldn't be rules, but no. is there? Are there? What would the norm Norms. be? I think your sense of density is different for every, uh, not even society, but community. What, what, you know, they would, what in the prairies you consider dense is kind of different than what you would think in central Ontario versus Hong Kong. So yeah. it's, it's all very different. Right. Yeah. And I, so I think the kind of rules of thumb is maybe a better way to describe it because there's no normal. And in a way, when you think of the first example in Beirut, like a postage stamp, but so important mm -hmm. to the people around that area 
um, and the fact that then globally there's international interest in it actually is, an, is, is a kind of interesting reciprocity between the very specific local and then someone like the Aga Khan Architecture Award sort of, you know, giving it a, a seal of approval. Mm -hmm. so. And, you know, again, let's come back to the favelas in Sao Paulo. Well, lanes are public spaces, right? Mm -hmm. They're open, um, although people watch. I mean, the community mm -hmm. watches. Kids play in them um, all night. There are, there's no gates that get locked um, when it gets dark at night. They're not designed, but they're public spaces mm -hmm. that really matter to those communities. Mothers get to know each other. They talk mm -hmm. while their kids are playing. Mm -hmm. Those are public spaces, too. We can't forget those. And those are, you know, you could almost call those pop-up public spaces, yes. right? Mm -hmm. And that's what I don't want us to miss. Mm -hmm. So now the other question was about uh, commercial, yes. and I actually think that the role of retail commercial activity, right. I actually think is very positive for most public spaces, mm -hmm. that in a way they, they actually are a kind of, they bring a kind of day-to-day -day normal requirements coffee shops, places to eat, uh, th those matter because they're about inhabiting these public spaces in really different ways. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, you see all these kind of, uh, you know, things that were considered unacceptable, food trucks. Portland, Oregon has actual public spaces shaped <laughs> by food by trucks, food trucks yeah. you know, That's and great. so the kind of, so it's a kind of, there's a whole, you know, the rules that, that actually govern what was proper and not proper, you just throw it out uh, right now. Yeah. We'll take another uh, trinity of questions, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit, go for it. I, you know, I guess the mic's not working. So. It doesn't matter, don't, sir. Well, my question was around small versus large as well, perhaps not as small as Campbellville, but uh, <laughs> bringing it back to Guelph in particular, you know, that are there special challenges for smaller cities compared to large cities? Because a lot of the thinking goes into large cities around public spaces and so on. And scale often matters. So that's the question to you is, is are there special, and you use the Market Square as a good example for a small community like Guelph, but are there specific challenges? Thank you, and um, Ms. Yes, are there examples of public spaces that promote connectivity between the urbanity and the rurality? Between urbanity and, and ru urban rurality? And rural. yeah. the, ur the, the urban, urban and rural, rural split. Uh, Richard, do you want to take that last one first? Ah, I mean, that's tricky, it's you know, because in a way, the kind of uh, the issues of um, scale, you know, which I think was also one of the other questions uh, within an rural context and issues of use differ quite dramatically from cities. And I actually think that you actually need to be quite specific to address both their physical context and the uses that actually want, that need to happen in those spaces. So I actually think that whether it's urban or rural, they actually need to be quite specific and particular as opposed to generic and, and fairly bland. And is so, the gentleman's question about small and large scale. addressed the same Again, way? Again, scale is so important. Yeah. And I think that in a way, you know, the example, the first example in uh, Beirut is like the size of a, a big house, yeah. you know? It, it's actually maybe the size of the, this actual physical stage that we're on is a public space. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it doesn't actually matter. I think you can actually work if you design properly you can create wonderful small public spaces in the same way that I really feel that Nathan Phillips Square is a wonderful large-scale civic public space. But I think the issue is that it needs to matter to the people it serves. Yeah, you know, I, I think the, those are really excellent questions Great, yeah. and they're not easy answers. Um, but I really would make really two important points. One is the importance of design, by which I mean coming together as a community um, with professionals and thinking through and listening and having a conversation about what matters. Why do those trees matter? You know, wh why is that important to us? What do we want our children? Do we have little children that we're worried about and we have to protect in this space? Any number of issues. So it's, 
it's the process leading up to the space, as you put it, Robert, that is really important. The second question was a really interesting one about the connections between urban and rural and what kinds of public spaces. So I'm just starting a research project, so I'm in a wonderful position where I don't know the answer, right? Because <laughs> that's what research is about. Uh, but we're starting a project in which we're looking at the innovation highways that connect cities to other communities. Mm -hmm. Because what's, what's so important when we try to understand innovation, what moves in, what moves out? Because no community today is self-sufficient, right? So it's those connectors in and out of the community that are so important to understand the community. And what we want to know about it is who makes the rules? Mm -hmm. Who governs what we call, and these are virtual highways, we're talking right. not mm -hmm. real ones, mm -hmm. but you know when we think about highways, who pays for the asphalt? <laughs> who, who decides whether a toll booth goes here or there? Those are the governance systems around real highways, material highways. Who pays for the innovation highways that connects one community to another community? And we're just starting the research on this and All we're right. going to look at it at different mm -hmm. scales. I'm doing it mm -hmm. with Anita again. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And I'll come back, we'll tell you in a year when we've done the research. <laughs> it's a very, it, it, your initial response is lovely when you talk about design, because the design is the making out of material something. Right. But if you think of the other meaning of the term, to have designs on the process is to engage mm -hmm. that notion mm -hmm. of, of, of the citizen engagement in the, yeah. in the whole process of making yeah. public It's space. both, it's yeah. really both, Robert. That's what we're saying. Yeah. Um, that's it. Uh, would you please join me in thanking our two guests tonight? And thank you. Thank you, Officer. You were fantastic. Great. Um, uh, Janet, they're going back to Toronto because I think they're. They were flying off to somewhere else about six o'clock in the morning or something. The one thing I should remind you of uh, is that uh, there will be a book signing. Uh, Miriam Taves is here uh, in the lobby afterwards where you can probably uh, get a book and a drink. Oh, are there books? I, or there aren't. There are, good. I'm glad to hear that. There are also books, by the way, I believe, of, of these two. There's the, the, Janice has done a number of books and the beautiful uh, book on the projects you've done, that gorgeous little that has a and afterward by uh, Mrs. Mies van der Rohe yes. <laughs> yes. is pretty great. So uh, join us in the lobby, and I, there may be one other thing that I have to announce. I don't want to miss out on. Could we just say thank you to Robert, yes. too? He was wonderful, wonderful to talk to. <laughs> wonderful. I've been invited to all the best lectures twice. <laughs> thank you very much. Great. We'll see you in the yeah. lobby. Yeah. Take care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was fun. Wrong, I'm wrong. There is, there, there is a thanks that has to have, sit your asses down. <laughs> <laughs> ahead. Jeez. So now I'm... <laughs> Now I'm really responsible for keeping you here between you and the reception. Um, I want to quickly, because uh, I know Janice hasn't left yet, and while Miriam is there, perhaps we can uh, bring the two gifts out that we would like to have for them. On behalf of our Guelph lecture on being Canadian, we just want to thank you so very, very much, and we'll thank the other presenters afterwards. And we're presenting a lovely gift to you, and thank you to Renan Isaacs of Renan Isaacs Contemporary Art for providing the gifts this year. They're paintings by Tanya Zareski, so please enjoy that. I know that you have to run, so we'll excuse you while we do the other thank yous. I wish. Now Michael is on his own. I mean, uh, Robert is on his own. I did that on purpose because of what you did to me. Remember what you said at the beginning? <laughs> 
And I know that um, Danny said thanks to, to Robert, but what an amazing MC that you've been, what an amazing moderator. You were funny, you were witty, and yes, you are pretty smart. I haven't met Michael yet, but you are pretty <laughs> wise, full of wisdom, <laughs> full of wisdom. And we have a gift, we have a gift for Robert as well. And while Robert is receiving his gift, if I could call Basha Bulat here to the stage, as well as Miriam Taze, we'd like to give you uh, a gift as well. Now, that beautiful voice, did you expect that gorgeous voice for that, those who have not heard her before? How powerful was that? And the playing, uh, the piano, and all the different instruments that she played. What was that instrument called? Uh, which one? The, what, the last one, the experimental oh, one. Um, it's a charango. A charango. OK, yeah. you've learned something new, something to add to the conversation. Yeah. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much for Thank having me. So yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Mary. Thank, Thank you all very much. Please give them a, a round of applause. And so we just have a couple more thank yous to, to give. And I know that our, our gentleman here that was giving the gifts, it's, I know that he's standing, he, he's just standing back here. Taylor Moran is a coordinator for the Guelph Lecture on Being Canadian. What an amazing job that you've done, Taylor. I just want to say thank you. What a great job. And thank you, Marva, for a wonderful job you're doing right now. <laughs> you're most welcome. And um, we want to also uh, thank, on behalf of the committee, we have a volunteer committee that is quite tremendous. And again, Taylor keeps everything and everyone in line. But the Aramasa Institute and the lecture um, on being Canadian, we could not and we do not exist without our uh, wonderful founders, and I'm gonna ask them to stand up and be recognized. I'm gonna call all their names, and if you could just applaud once, that would be great, that gets you out of here sooner. Uh, their founders, Doug McMillan, Valerie Hall, Louise McCallum, Joy Roberts, and Michael Bernstein. Can you stand up, please? They are responsible for what you see here. We thank you so much. And I know my name is Marva Wisdom, and I have the pleasure of, of being a part of the committee here. And we have a number of committee members um, in the room, and we thank you for your volunteer work. We also want to thank Wellington Water Watchers. You see these awesome uh, water bottles here uh, to make us more environmentally present, and they provided that for us. We also want to thank very, very much the food that you're going to get is Kali Insurance. Isn't that wonderful that an insurance company would be providing the food for you? you. No, he's, they're sponsoring the food for you. So please give them a round of applause. That's quite important. You have seen the number of sponsors that we have, and I'm not going to go through the names again, but I'm going to ask you, maybe we can quickly put the sponsors up again, just very quickly before, and then bring back the, uh, the Guelph Lecture Series. I think I'm throwing them off by saying that. If you can, that would be great. If you can't, that's understandable. We want to thank the Walrus Magazine. You will have about 300 magazines. I know there are more than 300 people in the room, but when we're talking about wonderful spaces for people to be, make room not elbow room for your other folks. We are going to give out 300, so we don't have enough for everyone, but we hope that several of you will go home with the Walrus Magazine that has really supported a Guelph Lecture so well, and, um, and they have a wonderful ad. If you want to subscribe, please feel free to do so. They support us year after year, and they have free magazines for you. It'll be handed out as you uh, leave the room. We also could not do this without other volunteers beyond the committee itself, uh, and certainly volunteers at the River Run Center and River Run Center staff. You, the public, for coming, for filling the seats. We were sold out this year, second time in 12 years. 
On a cold, blister day, you still came. We're going to ask you to not to forget to complete your survey. It is in your program, so if you pull it out, have a chance to complete it. We want you to go out, have a conversation, continue this talk about the importance of public space, continue the dialogue that you have heard here, uh, because it really is important in how we move forward as a community. Again, thank you to Aramasa Institute for the work that you've done in bringing this to us. Are we going to see you all next year? Do I hear a yes? Yes? See you next year. Please tell someone else. Have a wonderful night and enjoy the reception.